Hello everyone, welcome to season two of MetalNet. I have a lot of great guests for you, starting with Johnny D of Doro. Johnny D is also known for being the drummer of Britney Fox, and I'm gonna to talk to him today about both of his experiences as well as how he started in his career and a lot more. So don't forget to subscribe, don't forget to like this video, and don't forget to leave a really nice comment for Johnny. Here we go. Hello everyone, welcome to season two of Metalhead. I have an amazing guest for you. We have Johnny D of Doro and Brittany Fox. How are you, Johnny? I'm great, how are you doing? I'm doing well, thank you so much for joining me. Where are you right now? I am in Fulda, Germany, which is about an hour from Frankfurt. It's, if you look at the map of Germany, it's pretty much directly in the center. So I'm about three hours from Hamburg, Dusseldorf, Cologne, uh, Munich, Berlin. I mean, anywhere you want to go, it's kind of like just go outward. So nice. it's a pretty, you know, it's not the most exciting place to be, but it's definitely a nice place to to live and uh, pretty central in Germany. So you've moved there um, permanently? Yeah, yeah, I moved here um three years ago before my son was born and uh that obviously was like sealed the deal mm -hmm. to stay and try to you know try to make a life of it and and it's just crazy the timing of it all how it worked out because you know covid came like very shortly into it and it's just been like i've been blessed and cursed <laughs> at the same time you know lost a lot of work but also have been home for almost every day of my son's young life so that's been just amazing and I'm very grateful for that yeah yeah uh, yeah it's it's funny how COVID has been it has been sort of a blessing for some people in many ways even though it's taken a lot of way it's given certain other opportunities some folks so and i've gotten a chance to see pictures of weedy as we call him and he's yeah. super super cute um Aww. he's at that really fun age where um he posted something really cute of him lately where he's uh jumping around and playing drums and just doing all sorts of cute things he's at like the yeah. cutest age right now oh he's definitely uh just every day is a trip you know yeah it, they just get like more it's the things that just come out or that they do it's like oh my god where is this coming from it's <laughs> amazing it's it's a miracle really it's just unbelievable but i'm so blessed and thankful that you know he's doing good and healthy and everything and uh just enjoying it you know even though you want to like some days jump out the window or whatever like this <laughs> he can be a little terror as well but that's just the way it is you know that's part of being three years old, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, well, speaking of uh, being a little kid, one of the things I wanted to talk to you about was sort of your early days when you were young, because you were part of a generation that really influenced my generation. We're not that far apart in age, but what you and musicians your age did was really so significant to people uh, my age, as well as people older and younger than me, but really yeah. folks my age grew up with musicians your age. And I just want to talk about your childhood and when what you were listening to when you were about your son's age. What was the what was the music like when you were growing up? And you grew up <laughs> on the East Coast in the suburbs of Philly. Yeah. And what was going on when you were like a three, four, you know, little, little tyke like like your little guy? Well, I guess just um the earliest musical memories or influence I, I can remember is just um, uh, radio, TV, which was not like super blown up, you know, rock or metal at that time. There wasn't much happening. I mean, if you're going back to like three, four, five, I mean, I was probably you know, I loved like Batman and some TV series and, you know, there was songs involved with that. And there was like, I had an older sister who was listening to music. So, but the earliest stuff I remember is like, you know, the Beatles, not because, you know, I mean, I think I was too young to really see those moments that, that kind of got the generation before me hooked, you know, but I was also hearing that through my sister and, and obviously it was all over the radio and stuff. And 
Um, but yeah, I was listening to whatever was around. I was not really tuned in as much to my own thing yet. But then I was, I went to Catholic school for like uh, the first five years, six years of school. And, uh, and they were big on, on chorus and like choir or glee club, whatever you want to call it. It wasn't like, um, you know, but they would pretty much uh, check each student out to see, you know, what they could accomplish, what they could do. And I could sing actually pretty high and on key. I had a tenor voice and uh, the music teacher was like, okay, you're tenor in the show coming up and it's like whatever musical uh, you know, was happening if it was a Christmas thing or if it was something, a show thing for, you know, to entertain parents and stuff. So that was one of the earliest memories was singing uh, either Christmas songs and, and I actually got to do some solo stuff. There was me and another kid in my class that had like the highest voices. So we were doing all these like really high parts and stuff like that. So that was firstly just singing was was all I really knew you know and then I started to get more into uh, some of the bands my sister was listening to and then I started to really kind of um, yeah just like wow what is you know or to hear like Led Zeppelin whole lot of love on the radio driving in the car um, and being like what the hell is this you know <laughs> I mean it's like uh, I always remember uh, the middle part when Plant just screams way down inside. My my dad was like, what the hell is this? This guy <laughs> sounds like he fell down into a well. And I was like, mm, okay, whatever. You know, it sounds cool to me, but that's kind of how I started. And then, you know, of course. Tony, did, you, did you like it? Uh, did you like it when you were up there singing? Like, was it a positive? Did you like the attention that you were getting? Or were you just doing the thing that a teacher asked you to do? I, I don't have any recollection of the of the like sort of thing that I have now or did later on. I just really was like on autopilot somehow. I res remember particularly one time I remember trying to practice or study my lines when I was like sick as a dog. I was in bed with the fever and just like and I was like you know and I'm like I'm not going to be able to do it and stuff but I don't remember it being like the feeling of wow I got to get in front of an audience or anything right. like that you know it was just too surreal at that early age, like you know third grade or something like that it was like just doing what you do you know yeah but it's weird how it it just happens you know it's kind of like you're on autopilot and it just it, you know just kind of happens on its own how about the plant thing when you started here you know obviously you became a drummer not a singer but when you started listening to plant did you did you did it plant any sort of seeds in your mind of like oh i can i can sing like maybe i can make those sounds or or is that, did that come a little bit later as time had passed? I think a little bit later. My family always, my sister and my cousin, uh, Joanne, always um, kind of, you know, lovingly would make fun and say like, oh, I used to sing the Beatles, like, she loves you, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and I was probably like my son's age or maybe a little bit older, but, you know, I think... Um, like I said, I didn't really make a connection there as far as the singing thing. I just kind of had it inside of me. And then it, when I started playing drums, it kind of really didn't go anywhere else. I don't know why I never said, hey, I'm going to be a singer, you know, <laughs> probably a little bit too self-conscious. So, hey, you know, then it became, oh, I can hide behind the drums, you know, <laughs> right. and still. Well, maybe I if you did have that feeling, you might have become a singer, right? <laughs> right, right. Yeah. So when did the drums come into play? Like, what, what was your, like, did somebody influence you or did you have a knack? I think first it probably was a visual attraction for me. You know, I remember paging through like the Sears catalog and seeing like the drum kit. And, you know, I had a friend up the street that was like really into guitar and and I asked for a couple, uh, I asked for a drum kit, you know, pretty early on and I got, you know, 
I mean, was not a professional kit by any means. It was one of those paper headed things you buy at the toy store, you know, and that got destroyed immediately. So, um, you know, year after year, it kind of got closer and closer to the real thing. And, um, but I think, um, my sister used to have parties. She was in high school at the time. And she, my parents would, were so supportive and they kind of let us do whatever we wanted to, unless, you know, as long as it wasn't like bad, you know, but she was having like teenage parties in our basement with like black light posters all around and her friend's band from school would come down and jam and like play so I remember like just sitting there tripping, like they wouldn't let me down there or to stay. There was like, I'm like, what is that, man? There's like people making out in one corner. And I'm like, what the hell is like, you know, Sodom and Gomorrah in like a five-year-old's <laughs> mind or six or seven or whatever. And I'm like, but this band, you know, was like, wow, man, it's like they're in my basement, just like shaking the house. And I'm thinking like, this is so effing cool, you know, and the drummer, I don't know who it was or don't really remember anything, but I have some pictures of me sitting behind the drum kit. And I was like, obviously so into it, you know, but I don't know where the influence came from other than just some subliminal things that kind of affected me in that way you know so yeah and then from that point I just kind of like it just becomes an obsession and you just like follow that path you know mm -hmm. were you self-taught or did you uh did you study with people I was self-taught I went um when I finally got like a real kit my father f finally uh, caved in and got me a small you know it was like a little jazz kind of kit and um, yeah, it was like, we'll probably need to go to the music store and take some lessons. And I was um, getting into that real rebellious, uh, you know, age where I was just like, okay, go to the music store and lessons consisted of a practice pad or a rubber pad on the snare drum and just like the, the basic stuff that I could not, you know, compute at that time i'm like wait a minute this doesn't sound like uh what i wanted to sound like you know what i mean and i was like i can't do this you know this i want to play rock and roll i want to play beats i want to play song you know and i didn't have this foresight at that time to see like well yeah this will really help you you know down the road or whatever and i just quit after like a few two or three lessons and i went home put the headphones on dropped the needle and just started playing along to records and taught myself how to play you know play some songs play some beats and and eventually that developed into you know finally playing with some other people but that was a little bit later on yeah. And how old, about how old were you when you finally got that, like that real kit where you could really start playing and teaching Probably, yourself? Um, I think around 12. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I had um, one big event that happened was when I was in seventh or eighth grade, I had, I would, I was riding motorcycles quite a lot at that time. And um, I had, mini bikes and motorcycles from a very early age um you know i mean we were just like a bunch of punks i mean smoking cigarettes at like 10 years old and stuff like that and then riding bikes and doing crazy shit and evil knievel was like all the over the tv and we were just like let's just like jump over shit and break stuff and just the most insane stuff that a kid I don't know, you know, how you could get away with that and not like, you know, it's amazing that we didn't die, but I did crash the bike once and I broke my left leg like really bad, spent a whole summer in the hospital and in a bed at home. And that was the like epiphany moment that um, I was like, okay, I'm, I'm not going to become a professional motorcycle, uh, you know racer or whatever i'm gonna <laughs> sit here and i'm just gonna fucking fall into this like 
dreamland of like rock music and and records and that's when i really started to um just get into my sister's album collection and just be like whoa you know I put these on and i had nothing but time to sit there and absorb it all and that's really the moment that i kind of made this switch you know and all of a sudden like saw something you know before that it was just like do whatever you know and then now it was like oh my god this is amazing you know i want to listen to music i want to try to make music i want to play drums in a band i want to do all that and that was it is this was this like a moment where you decided that i'm going to be a musician like this is what i'm going to do for my life or was this just this is my passion and you hadn't quite decided yet yeah just passion no other really sensible yeah. thought pattern about <laughs> it. I mean it was you know no yeah. idea that you could even make it or make it to a point where you make records or you know that you you know I didn't even think about like do these guys make money I didn't realize if they were rich or poor or just it was just like wow you know I'm obsessed with it and it's a passion and that's that's all I knew and, yeah. it and who kind are you of listening continued. to at this point? Who are you listening to? Who are you um, listening to at this point? Uh, well, my sisters. I went from listening to like the Beatles and the Monkeys. I remember watching the Monkeys on TV and being like, "Oh wow, you know, this is this is pretty funny. It's cool. The songs are good and stuff." But then um, a little bit later on, I found. Uh, uh, the record Alice Cooper Killer in my sister's collection and it basically has a bow constrictor on the cover and it's just like in this like psychotic scribble you know and I was just like what in the hell is that you know put it on and listened and I was just like freaking out you know and then Billion Dollar Babies and then you know all kinds of other stuff from Elton John uh, Goodbye Yellowbrick Road or um don't shoot me i'm only the uh piano player that's like still one of my most favorite records you know so i went from like alice to elton and all this kind of uh visual stuff that was going on you know i remember my sister had a, a poster of alice cooper on her on her wall and i was just like wow you know this is amazing but uh, a couple records that I still remember were Deep Purple, Machine Head, um, yeah, Elton John, Alice Cooper, um, all kinds of different stuff, ELO, um, everything that was just like blossoming in the 70s, Zeppelin, Pink Floyd, all that kind of stuff. It just was like you just feasting on this and just like, you know, never getting full, just like, oh, what is this? What is that? And it was like such a crazy, cool time for music too. So when did you become active and start playing in bands and start getting professional to where you could put yourself out there? Um, well, I went from sort of playing in the basement by myself along to records and then kind of the next phase was like getting together with a couple school mates or neighbors and trying to play and um, just kind of getting acclimated to oh let's learn a song and and just you know do it and then it becomes like you're not in this like enclosed thing you're actually you know interacting with other people and like oh that doesn't sound like the record. Hmm, I got to get better at that point. Or, wow, that guy really sucks. He can't play. So we need to get somebody else. And, and so that phase, you know, lasts for a little while. And then um, one day, uh, a classmate of my sister's came by with another dude. And they're like five, six years older than me. And, you know, everybody in the neighborhood knew that I played drums because it was just like shaking the whole house. And my parents are up there with the TV like on 10 and just like the poor 
things were just like having to deal with that shit every night, you know, but these guys came around and, uh, they're like, oh, we hear you playing drums and, uh, I know your sister, but we need a drummer. And, you know, we wanted to check, check you out. And I was like, what? Like, I'm just like, I don't know. I mean, I don't know anything. And I know some songs and stuff. Well, all right, well, um, here, take these records and like, you know, learn this and that and check this record out. And I was like, okay, you know, and uh, I learned a couple songs and I learned about some other different bands that I didn't know about yet. And uh, yeah, and then we started playing and I learned like so much from these older guys, you know, I mean, they probably saw this kid's got some like raw talent and, you know, he's pretty good. And we have a fucking place to rehearse. You know? <laughs> right. And so it <laughs> became so like, mind. <laughs> right. So now everybody's fucking hanging out at my house and my parents are, hey, you want a shot of whiskey or whatever, <laughs> or have to sit down and eat, you know, Italian family always. Right. Did you eat yet? Or yeah. So, um, yeah, and one of the guys, ironically, was Billy Childs, Billy Degley from okay. Brittany, who, um, yeah, was a few years older. And uh, when I got together and started playing with those guys, I really, like, my level of competency just went, like, way up, you know, and taught me a lot and, and what, you know, what was good and what was not. And, and just like, you know, a lot of, like I said, a lot of different bands that I didn't really know about at that point, I was completely obsessed with kiss mm -hmm. and, you know, being 13 or 14, you know, all the older teenagers were like, kiss sucks, man. You know, they sold out and all that. They stuff. had already gotten to that point where they were right. over it. And, and they're like, Black Sabbath, dude. Fuck <laughs> kiss. You know, they're stupid. And I was like, no, they're not. And then, you know, you learn as you go. And that's, that's kind of how the switch came to a, playing not really originals yet. We were learning covers, mm -hmm. but when you start to learn, you know, like a Rush song, for example, you're like, your your level of musicianship has to rise up and then you kind of think, wow, that's cool. You know, how did they come up with that part? And then you start to develop a little bit. Uh, this is all before, you know, none of us had School of Rock or any of these kind right. of things right. where you can go and learn this stuff. You know, it's like learning by doing. And that was that was how it happened for me. Yeah, yeah. Um, so then did you and Billy start, uh, you were playing together. Were you still doing all covers? When did you guys start uh, forming bands? We did the cover thing for, I guess, a few years or so. And then... Um, I'm not sure if I had done any originals with Bill at that time. I think I got an opportunity to join a band. Um, funny, funny enough, it was with John Karabi. Oh, cool. And, um, and, you know, these guys were local kind of dudes, South Philly, you know, I was in the suburbs and, uh, I don't even remember how we hooked up, but it was one time I got offered a gig with these guys and they were called Fragile at the time. And it was John and three other guys from Philly and they were looking for a drummer. And I was like, wow, they have their own fucking songs. You know, I was like, this is cool. You know, I got to go for this. You know, I don't want to play covers anymore. And these guys are like, they would do some Zeppelin and other stuff, but they actually had like songs that John was writing and, you know, they were definitely another level up. So I did that. And, um, and yeah, we started to, I learned like the songs they had, we wrote a couple more together. And that was the first time I ever went into the studio to actually record Mm -hmm. And luckily, like, you know, this is all before click tracks and, and all that kind of experience, you know, that's necessary. And we just went in for like a day and cut four tracks pretty much live with a few overdubs. And I was, 
you know, lucky and actually very relieved that like, wow, I can do this, you know, like I didn't sounded pretty good on tape and, you know, they were all (laughs) cool with it. And I was like, wow, you know, so that was another milestone for me to go, you know, first time in the studio to actually like do it pretty good and, and be like, wow, you know, I imagine you were really nervous, but did you enjoy it? I did, you know, hearing that back, you know, because you up until that point, we would like record with a boom box or something and just like, you know, to learn songs or to write stuff just to hear a reference, but to hear something that's like super well engineered and like, you know, just the whole vibe of it. Wow, this sounds like professional, you know. And John had done it before. He had experience, you know, with this this band and, and some before that. So it was like, it was very normal for him. But for, you know, for me, it was like the first time was like, whoa, you know. And then after that, of course, that's another notch on your gun. And you're like, <laughs> okay, now let's keep going. So that was, that was pretty cool. Nice. And then where'd you go after Fragile? Um, well, Fragile... Uh, I went out to LA, speaking of LA, like we were about earlier, minute, yeah. <laughs> um, I went out to LA for like, I think it was senior week or something like me and a couple of my buddies were like, let's go to California, man. And we got it together. We went out there for like a week or so. And I was just blown away, like just, you know, all of it and never have had been there before. And I was just like, this is fucking amazing. And you know, there's bands like serious bands out here and stuff like that. This is where it's happening. Like I didn't, nothing was really happening in Philly, although there was some cool bands that weren't really going anywhere, you know? And I went back home and I was like to John and the guys, look, we got to move to LA. Like that's the fucking thing. If we're going to do anything with this band, like that's where we got to go. And they were like, oh man, you know, who was married at that time and who had this and that. And John was married and, you know, nobody really was into just up and leaving. So I was like, okay, um, yeah, I'm going to move on. And ironically, they all moved there, like, you know, a year or two later, <laughs> Not, right? like, you know, you dick. <laughs> but then I got another uh, opportunity with a Philly band called World War Three. Okay. And those guys were, um, again, older, I seem to always like gravitate towards these older dudes, you know, but it was just like, probably the lack of, of real, you know, players at, and at that time and in the area it was like I was lucky enough to get in with with guys that were better than me that I could really like rise up to you know so these dudes there was two brothers Dan and Gary Hammer one his nickname was Sledge (laughs) Sledge (laughs) Hammer and um they were they were great man these guys were so ahead of their time unfortunately a little bit too ahead and too old to really make it when the Philly scene started to really cook, you know? Um, but man, they had some of the coolest early metal stuff. And these guys were pulling like hundreds of people in an old barn, like out in the burbs. And they would just, you know, five bucks admission keg of beer, and they would play their entire uh, repertoire for people and all these metal heads were freaking out about this band, you know, nobody really knew about them except local people, you know? So uh, the funny tie in with that band is that Dean Davidson was the drummer at the time. Oh, okay. And he was just like leaving to start his front man dream, you know? And so I end up replacing Dean on drums in this band and they were really cool. We did some recording with them as well. Put a record out on a a French independent label called Axe Killer Records. This was like the time around when uh, the indie scene started to really pick up, you know, fanzines and metal, little metal magazines and like tape trading 
and all this stuff. So World War III was like sending tapes and 45s out all over the place. And one landed in England at Kerrang! magazine. And they really dug the band. They started like writing, doing small write-ups about them and stuff like that. So at that point, I was like, wow, you know, here we are doing this. And like we're written up in a French or a or an English magazine, you know, and it's like really cool. Like you feel like, wow, we're we're going somewhere, you know, we're getting closer to whatever the hell that holy grail is, you know. And um so yeah, I spent some time in World War Three and really uh, enjoyed playing with those guys and and playing that heavier stuff and uh, and learning more about writing and original music and and you know drumming, recording, playing live, all that kind of experience was building up a little bit, and that was around the time when like the Philly scene was starting to cook and Cinderella and a couple other bands were playing around. And um, yeah, that was. So let's take a minute to talk about that. So it sounds like when you had gone to visit LA, LA was already huge and booming and lots, lots of things happened. I'm guessing, was yeah. it like Motley Crue and bands like that? Were it was probably 80, 1980 or so. Okay. And it was like, even, you know, probably like on the strip maybe you know I, I don't even know because I, I don't even know if I was able to get in the clubs the first time I went <laughs> you know it's like on the strip but not really in tune with what bands were there you know but yeah but you were probably just cruising up and down and just hearing it was pretty early on happening, right you know? yeah. so it might have even been like maybe Quiet Riot and yeah that probably. kind of stuff right so but if it's you I think we're at that cusp of when huge things were happening in Philly. So you and I talked about this before we started the interview. A lot of the bands that I came up on, like my biggest bands that I love that were always called LA bands were actually from kind of the Northeast. And I'm including Philly in that. I don't know if you guys are technically Northeast or not, but it was the Cinderella's, the Poisons, Britney Fox, and then, you know, the Jersey bands like Skid Row and Bon Jovi. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You guys were all from, some of those bands are called East Coast bands like Skid Row and Bon Jovi, but, you know, Poison and Cinderella and all those guys, everybody credits as being LA bands, but you guys all really kind of like wrote your songs and did your things kind of before anybody like went out that way. What was happening in Philly? What did you see? Because you were there, you grew up in that area and that what was kind of happening that you saw as those bands were coming up um, that 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 you that you would credit to like that great music happening like what what was happening that made for those great songs those great the cool image and they're just solid bands i think well i never saw poison i know they left pretty early they they played like the harrisburg scene and then they split for la so they're one pa band that did go to la and and blow up out there but cinderella never did britney fox never did even though we were you know like you said called the LA band or whatever we only went out there to do a video or two and then when we the tour stopped in LA we played LA we never went never played LA before we had a record out or anything like that so it really did stick to your roots and stayed stayed uh close to home yeah I mean at that point it was like why go somewhere where there's like eight billion bands to Mm -hmm. compete with when you can pretty much you know like we literally took Cinderella's slot at the Galaxy this is before I was even in the band but they you know like Cinderella was top bill you know and then when they went to record it was like okay next up and that was Britney Fox and then kind of like had a built-in following but what was happening at that time was like I explained earlier with World War III was there was bands who were finally because the the generation before us uh, was these amazing cover bands you know it was not like it is now I mean literally these bands in Philly and South Jersey, down the Jersey Shore, they were playing shit that was like, you know, okay, see, P- 
Pegasus do, you know, a Yes show or whatever. And this one does Led Zeppelin and that one does a Genesis show. And this one does, you know, whatever, where they're playing all the stuff like Bad Company, Van Halen, uh, you know, Foreign or all these killer bands. And they're playing, you know, because rock was just ruling, you know, everywhere. It was like, so as this started to shift into people like, really um doing their own music uh there was a band called the dead end kids from from jersey you know and they were like our motley crew they were badass they were fucking scary as hell they were like on the you know they were pioneers of like mixing covers with original music they had their own songs, you know, but I went into a club. It's like the first summer that I could drink, you know, and I saw them and I was blown away as everybody else that had seen them was, you know, they had like makeup, they were doing like Bowie, all this, like, you know, these stage moves, you know, and we were all like, whoa. And they were the first guys that we all saw that did spinning guitar thing around the back and shit like that. So, you know, that was a huge influence for all of us a little bit younger to see a band just like theatrical, great musicians playing covers, but also some of their own original music. So, uh, that was like in everybody's head. So then everybody's like, oh, dude, we got to like write songs. We got to be a band, you know, uh, because nobody wanted to be those guys kind of got stuck in the cover scene and they couldn't get out of it because, I mean, it was good money. But, you know, you can't go on tour because if you go to, you know, Ohio, nobody knows who you are and you're not going to get paid shit because nobody's going to be there. But if you're down Jersey Shore and you have a packed house and they're doing like, you know, five, six sets a night, I mean, it's a pretty lucrative thing. So, you know, this was like their a downfall, I, I would say, because they just like could not escape that thing. But the next generation really couldn't, couldn't lose because they were like, we're writing and the scene for original music was coming up. People were going to see bands play originals as opposed to wanting to just hear the same songs over and over again. So that was what everybody was feeling who kind of got into that next level of like, okay, now we're in the clubs playing our own music and people are coming and really digging it. And that's how Cinderella got signed because, you know, Bon Jovi went to a packed club and saw them doing their thing. And, you know, it just was, rock was, was on the launching pad. I mean, it was on TV, it was on the radio. So it was like bands were just, in line to just be the next you know the next ones and that's that's how the transition was made in philly south jersey the whole area even a little bit more south you had kicks mm -hmm. who was doing it years before any of us you know those guys were like definitely uh, out of our reach a little bit you know we didn't really go down that far but I would see them in some magazines that were printed from around the Lehigh Valley and the Harrisburg, like the central Pennsylvania area. Those guys were doing that scene and it was like, wow, these guys are cool, you know? Yeah. Um, so it was all kind of happening. And then, you know, it obviously has to come to a head at some point. And that was probably Cinderella being signed because there was other Philly, there was another Philly scene Mm -hmm. which was more like new wavy or like just like very a little bit more commercial mm -hmm. like Robert Hazard and the A's and all these other bands that were like you know um, the Hooters early on and uh, but that wasn't like heavy rock you know like we were all really into so that came a little bit later. Um, it seems like there was a lot of loyalty between um, Philly bands. Did, did you feel that that was the case? 
I think so. There, I think it, it was a bit of both. I think there was some, you know, um, co obviously competition there. Um, but, you know, the, I think when you find people that you gravitate towards or can be friendly with and others just kind of like, you're not, I mean, that's just the way it is. And then people get jealous because you're doing this and they're not doing that. But I think um, it was weird because in, in our case, in Brittany Fox's case, um, you know, Michael and Tony, the original drummer from Cinderella were fired from the band. So there was immediately some hard feelings there, you know? So I think it took a little while until I know Tom wanted to help them, but it was not like, you know, such an immediate, because you, I think as a band, you know, you're so protective of what you, what opportunities you get, you know, I see it a lot. It's like the people that really have nothing to worry about, aren't worried about trying to help somebody else, you know, but sometimes it's like, well, dude, you know, like I got my fucking piece of meat now, nobody else is going to get it, you know, and that's, you know, that's when it gets weird, but it did turn out that Tom, you know, did the deal and had Brittany open for them when they headlined the convention center in Wildwood, New Jersey and let them open. And that's the night that uh, the rep from Columbia came down and saw the band and decided to sign them. So in that sense, it was like you know, it's like on the one hand people got screwed and but on the other hand yeah i mean it was almost i mean it was very cool to you know okay sorry you know you got screwed but like i can throw you this little bone to hopefully okay. make up for it you know and that was very cool not many people are willing to do that um but yeah and just to clarify for anybody who doesn't know um they were members of cinder the original lineup of cinderella and it was the record label who came in and said we don't want these two people in cinderella we need to hire other folks is Pretty that right much. yeah i think yeah. it was either the a and r guy or somebody was just like okay we love the band but like the you know the image these guys probably look a little bit too weathered you know and uh, we need to get some younger blood in there. I mean, I had it happen with with uh, the band Wasted that I was in, and that was um, something we kind of skipped the whole over. I don't know how I spaced on that, but that. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's let's talk about Wasted for a minute. Yeah. Um, and and let me just ask this quick question: Is that a death sentence? Was that a death sentence for a musician back then? If they said you're let's say weathered too weathered does that mean you're done like or or in the case of these guys they ended up getting signed with Britney Fox does it just yeah. mean you're not right for this band or is it for some people was it just like dude you're too old forget it it's not going to happen for you yeah I think it depends like you said it could be an individual situation or it could be something that kind of you get tagged with and that's like it just won't go away you know but um fortunately for Michael he had a second chance and you know and was able to really uh, get there with Brittany you know to a certain degree obviously Cinderella was like you know way way further down the road but it was like uh you know at least he got to make a record or two or three and, and right. really, you know, get to that point. But um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, some people have that stigma attached or it could be completely unknown what the reason is. I mean, I could, you know, rattle off a shitload of bands that really had everything in line and got signed and then did a record and then the record gets shelved and then you never saw the light of day with it or, you know, it was so random. I mean, that's why the Britney thing was so um, fortunate was because like the band had its shit together and didn't really have to have any kind of like, you know, uh, in you know intrusion by a label or so because it's like okay we have the name we have the image 
You have the songs. We don't need a producer that's going to come in and put strings on shit or change it. You know, all the, I mean, it's, it is what it is. Yeah. If you sign it, you know, you obviously know and want that. So let's just do it. And we made our record literally without hardly any changes to any of the songs or anything like that. It was just go in the studio, record the band live and, and put it out. And that was not happening with a lot of bands. A lot of bands got signed. Okay, you know, we're going to do this. You're going to get a clothing designer. You're going to get your hair cut this way. You got to have more of this and that. And then it's like they become something that they're not even really wanting to be, you know, and that's another scenario that was happening a lot. I think a lot of bands got a little bit too messed around with or jumped onto this hair thing and, and the clothes and ever just because like, hey, we if we want to put a record out, we have to look like this, you know? Right. Right. So. Um, was Britney was part of the re reason Britney was so together and not messed around with because they already you guys already knew what you wanted because a you had partly gone through it with Cinderella, um, or, or because you just didn't want to be fucked around with because you had already been through it with Cinderella and that or was it just something different was it because you had already embraced the whole glam thing so that they were like oh we don't need to mess with these guys they already have the big hair they already have the cool costumes they already have the sound like what yeah. what was it about it because I feel like when you read about a lot of bands they do get messed with they did get the extensions yeah. and all that so what was it about you guys where you could just kind of come to the table and say here's the package and you just didn't get messed with well, I have to credit Dean for that. He had a lot of the um, the concept in his head when, you know, and, and even if that may have been like Cinderella as the, you know, as the mold, you know, um, it still was like, okay, if I'm going to do something like that, I'm going to write these songs and I'm going to wear this and I'm going to do that. And then when Michael and Tony joined, it was like, okay, well, there's half your band right there. Mm -hmm. The sound is there, you know? It's like you're, you're half of Cinderella now. Mm -hmm. And obviously oh. not being Tom Kiefer, but being trying to be Dean Davidson. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, credit to him for that concept and, uh, and for writing those songs and, them being pretty good songs that didn't have to be like messed around with or you know it wasn't like uh, you guys are great but we need to bring in some songwriters or something like that it was literally just like a package you handed to them and said put this out and it'll probably do well and that's what happened so yeah I think having that all kind of ready to go was a big plus for us because you know, if we didn't, we could have been molded into something and just kind of like fell off the shelf and never were seen again. Yeah, you had mentioned that something similar had happened to you in Weathered than had happened to some of your bandmates. What ha uh, what was your situation with Weathered? Oh, um, yeah, the band Wasted. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, Wasted. My no, no, it's okay because weathered was like the term. <laughs> Weathered's for, the term we used earlier. For the older musicians <laughs> getting canned, you know, and bringing in <laughs> fresh new blood. But it was Pete Way and Paul Chapman from UFO, and they were getting help from uh, Steve Harris in Iron Maiden, who got them uh, a deal with EMI Capital. And they, you know, they were older dudes, they've been around since the seven six late 60s pete i mean ufo came out in like 69 or something so the label was like you know let's get some new blood in here let's reduce the overall band age down you know <laughs> by like eight years or something like that and that's when they brought in myself and danny vaughn on vocals and uh my buddy Jim Delella was playing keyboards and guitar and stuff. So um, that was a similar situation where they um, they had brought in some younger players, not only to reduce the band age, but to also, you know, young guys can be taken advantage of very easily, you know, which is something we all learned the hard way. And it's like you have two veterans 
getting another record deal, you know, after years of like mishandling money and all that kind of shit. So why would they get like, you know, a bunch of guys, more veterans when they can get some new dudes in or just happy to be like making a record, being on tour, being in a video, making a little bit of money at playing music, you know, and not right. really. You're, in the, you're still in the, I'd do it for free phase of your career, right? <laughs> right. Yeah. And then all of a sudden you, you know, the record comes out and you realize like, wow, there's no credit for lyrics, for example, you know, and and then it's like, oh, great, you know, like, wow, we really made it. We thought we did, but now we're really realizing that, uh, you know, we're getting screwed over. So, you know, you learn, fortunately learned that lesson pretty early on. You know, I was like 21 or something at that time. And then, you know, jumped into Britney and knew all this other stuff, you know, not that it helps immensely because, you know, you, whenever you go up to bat in the record business, you know, it's either a, a strikeout or a home run, you know, and even if you get a home run, you're not guaranteed that you're going to like really, you know, get to the world series or something like that. And it's like very, yeah, it's so weird how it all happens or doesn't happen but it's like you really got to enjoy the ride and and we did yeah thank you guys so much for watching this video and again don't forget to subscribe i have a lot of amazing guests coming up in season two i had a lot of amazing guests in season one make sure you check out all those videos thumbs up everything leave nice comments for everyone and see you guys soon for the next video take care